Welcome to the PIO Podcast, a place for all things public information related for police, fire, EMS, and local government. An open forum to learn, grow, and develop your public information skills. You host Robert Tornabeni is a public information officer with over 10 years in the field and 27 years of law enforcement background. In each episode, we will explore different aspects of the public information officer profession. Weekly, we will delve into the field of public information by talking to other PIOs. So sit back and enjoy this episode. Good afternoon. Today on the PIO podcast, we have the Director of Communications for the Idaho State Police, Lynn Hightower. Lynn, welcome to the show. Yeah. Hey, Robert. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. You were recommended by a, uh, another guest, and we thought that you would be an excellent person to have on because you have some unique prospects and background that is, uh, I think, beneficial for our listeners. So let's, let's really talk about that background and communications. Where did you get it from? And then how did you, what did you do before you were in the state police? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. And, uh, and whoever recommended me, I'll have to know who, uh, who I owe lunch. So I, that's, that was very kind of them. Um, and where my background, that's a, that's a bit of a story. I've been doing this for, for 30 years. Uh, I like to say I started when I was 12. But um, I started actually as a, a journalism, uh, economics and political science major at San Diego State University, where my dad was a San Diego police officer for a number of years. And my uncle was with San Diego police. Um, And I got my first job working in television news in Montana, and I worked at TV stations in Montana and then worked at the ABC station here in Boise for a number of years. And in between Montana and coming to the TV station at Boise, I actually was hired as an assistant press secretary for the then governor of Montana, Stan Stevens, back in the 90s. And I was uh, very young, but it was a very interesting way to learn about communications at that level of state government. Um, But I wanted to get back into news. And so I I, uh, got a job as the weekend anchor here at the ABC station in Boise. And over the years worked my way from, I I anchored, I produced, I was a reporter and I worked my way into the news director position, which essentially is managing the newsroom people in the product. Uh, And uh, and then in 2003, I was hired to be the, um, the public information officer for the Boise Police Department. And I stayed there for almost 13 years. And and when I was hired, the department was actually struggling with its uh, its reputation at the time, with public trust and confidence. There had been a series of officer-involved shootings. And although all, all of those shootings were found eventually to be justified, at the time, the agency got out so little information. I, I, looking back on it, and I was the news director at the time during, during all of these, we were covering these and reporting on them. I think, the, I think the public wanted to trust the agency, but it was almost as if the agency wouldn't let them. There, the agency had a PIO at the time. It was a lieutenant. It was an ancillary duty. He did five other, you know, 20 other things. Uh, he did the best he could do. But sadly, that series of officer-involved shootings ended with the death of a Boise police officer. Mm shooting. And that, um, that death is uh, certainly still felt very deeply in the agency today. Um, but a number of changes came because of that. There was a civilian community ombudsman, police ombudsman that was hired by the city. And although that position has morphed a little bit, that position is still in existence. And they, they hired a, a civilian PIO to help guide their messaging. And I worked with, and they hired a new police chief uh, who I worked with for 10 years. And and I led the public messaging component of that, but he led what really was a, a change in culture at that department at the time. And certainly the, the public messaging was, was an important component of it, but I was really just reflecting what was happening in the agency. And it, it was some pretty impressive stuff that, that really carried the agency a hell of a long way. Chief Mike Masterson, he's now retired. Uh, he came from Madison, Wisconsin, uh, originally where he was a captain, um, but he, uh, it was it was an incredible experience to work and learn from him and to work with the police department at that time. Um, and the city of Boise does a, a citizen survey every couple of years. And um, in 2012, 2014, it's a citizen satisfaction survey. And by that time, what the citizens of Boise were saying was they had a high, a high amount of trust in their police department. Um, and it was impressive. Um, and then we just worked to maintain that trust. So um, uh, and then I, I, I was actually approached to take the job uh, in 
in 2015, at the end of 2015, as the executive director of the Downtown Boise Association. And that is the Downtown Business Association. And lots of cities and towns have these. They, they, um, they charge an assessment, like a tax, for special downtown services for marketing and things like that. But at that time, great, great business people downtown. But at that time, that um, it's a nonprofit, it's a contractor for the city. And the, the association was struggling with why, why, what were people getting from their assessment? Um, why did people have to pay this tax? So, um, and it was important. It's important to economic development of the city to have a strong downtown. So my task was really to come in and take some of the messaging strategies that I'd used at the police department and apply them into the downtown business environment, which, which was really interesting and really fun. But one of the things that I learned there, and I always knew it intuitively, but man, it just, um, it just smacked me in the face every single day was the value of public safety. And I had the opportunity, literally value, return on investment. And I see you nodding your head. Yeah, yep, you get it. ROI, uh, yep, absolutely. Yeah, you absolutely get it. The, um, I, had, I, I had the opportunity to meet with developers from all around the country and they're coming into downtown Boise and into Idaho and they, they just got tens of millions of dollars burning a hole in their pocket. And they wanna know information about downtown. They're, they're coming here to build here. And, and almost every single one of them told me that what attracted them to, to Boise and to Idaho was the feeling of safety. People safe here. And that's where people, nobody wants to live or invest or start a new business or build a $70 million building in an area where people aren't going to want to go because they don't feel safe. So, right. And that's, that's, that's an interesting thing. So that, that was what, 13, 14 years ago. Um, that for, for me, I worked at the downtown Boise association in 2016, 17, 18, 19. Yeah. Booming, okay. booming so, years for downtown Boise. So yeah. now cities across America right now are struggling with the violence that's going on. And now even more so we have to be on top of our messaging game because of that. Um, and I, I think that absolutely underscores the value that, that public safety services bring. If public safety is economic development. And I think that is kind of an undertold story uh, from law enforcement. I agree. Um, and I think you'll understand because I, I heard the podcast where you were interviewed. And I think you'll understand, though, I'd gotten out of law enforcement. And you know what? I missed it. So um, by that time, a couple of years ago, the, the colonel of the Idaho State Police had come to me and asked me to work with him on a couple of contract uh, projects. Uh, and then he hired me. So now I'm in my, my second year with the Idaho State Police. And I'm, I'm super proud and happy to be here. Nice. Well, you've definitely taken a, an interesting uh, roundabout way of going, you know, in and out of law enforcement, but uh, certainly impacting law enforcement and community safety all the way. So kudos to you and an outstanding job. So okay. your, your position as a director, you're obviously not a one person show. How big is the staff that you have that work? Um, yeah, you were very kind to suggest that I am not a one person show. Uh, at the moment, I certainly am. Uh, we actually, <laughs> I call it the public affairs office, and really it's me. Um, there, there used to be two people. There's, there are officially two people that work for statewide, that work in the agency statewide, but that person has been TDY'd onto another project at the moment. Um, she is certainly available to help, and she does, but um, but right now it's, right now you're looking at the Idaho State Police <laughs> Public Affairs Office. But the cool thing is, the and the essential thing is, is there are good people that know what they're doing around the state. So um, I work with uh, I work with our troopers, with our folks all around the state, um, and they, um, you know what they? I, I'm fortunate to work with a, an agency of people that get it. So I work with them frequently. In fact, I'm talking to you from our agency or from our district in Jerome today, near Twin Falls, um, because we had a project down here today. So I came down to help out with that. Let's jump into a couple of the questions here. So whenever I talk to somebody, I do a little bit of research on to see what they've talked about, especially when it comes to the field of public information or communication. So I came across an article that I sent you from Connected Cops that you brought up a couple, uh, you brought up some comments and one of them was the unwelcome communications. What do you mean by those? Yeah, you know, I think I think at the time that article was written, there, there wasn't quite the number of trolls that there are today. Um, and social media, for those of us who have been around using social media for law enforcement since, um, you know, I think, uh, we started our, our department Facebook page back in 2009, um, and there were just a handful of agencies on there. You know, it, was, it started off as a very cool kind of experimental community of people, and people thought it was really cool that law enforcement was on there. Wow, we can actually interact one-on-one. Interact -on -one. 
with our, our police agency via social media, you know, it's not actually that kind of community anymore. Um, but I, I think what that, what, what we were talking about in that article was there, there are naysayers, there are going to be negative comments. Everybody knows that it's a fact of life on, on social media today. Um, there, and there's a difference between trolls. Trolls are just trying to be disruptive, but darn it all, if we don't have to actually read over some of those maybe less than positive comments um, from time to time, there are really good nuggets um, there. They may be disguised as a quote negative comment, but it's, it's a question or it's a comment from someone who has not received good service in the past. And uh, just over the course of the years, responding, paying attention to those comments as, as sometimes as unwelcome as they are, but they're there and they're real. And, you know, we've got a couple of stories that uh, showed, you know, somebody was, for example, a woman was very um, uh, critical of our, our victim services in a couple of posts. And I, so I, I actually reached out to her. I'm like, is, is there something we can talk about? We took that conversation offline. Turns out that she, um, you know, I kind of hate to say this, but she was a, a victim of a crime and she probably did not receive the best service that she could have from our agency. And so I actually gave that to a lieutenant. They reopened that case. The case didn't go anywhere. There were good reasons why the case sadly didn't go anywhere, but we had failed in our communication with her and letting her know what was happening. And and so when that when the lieutenant was able to get back with her, it, it really changed her life and changed the perception of, of our agency. But most importantly, it changed her life. This traumatic thing happened and we, we didn't quite do right by her. Right. And, and, and the advantages yeah. of, of having that opportunity that to for the ability to reengage with somebody, you take a negative experience and you have the opportunity to, to turn it into a positive, whether yeah, you yeah. take it offline or you it's something that occurs in the online world itself. So it, it doesn't matter where it occurs so long as you, you're at least listening. Exactly. You're listening, you're trying to engage. And, you know, and there's all these strategies, one, one and done, or I'll, I'll engage twice and see if they still want to be snarky. You know, a guy that I, I thought kind of had a snarky message, turned out his daughter was, was a witness to a very serious crime. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we were able to kind of pull her in. So, you know, it's, it, you, you got to actually read all those comments um, uh, disengage when they're when they're just meant to, to be rude or disruptive. Or, but you know what? Sometimes there is a nugget of, of something that you can really benefit. Um, you can really improve your service by just looking for sometimes there are some nuggets in those otherwise, again, quote unquote, negative comments that people write. Darn it all if we just got to read them and, and, and look at each one individually. I agree. So Lynn, what does managing the message mean? Why is that so important? You know, um, when I was a reporter, um, and I know there's a lot of PIOs that used to be reporters. You know, when I was a reporter, I could tell that when I walked away from interviewing someone, often I was the one who was in charge of that interview. There's a difference between a question-driven interview and a message-driven interview. And the kind of in the way I, you know, I, I, I train our folks on this now, and, and the reporter is not our audience. When we're doing it, when we're specifically speaking to about a media interview, the reporter isn't our audience. They now, they've got five other stories they're doing that day. I, I used to say, and I still say as a reporter, I was an inch deep and a wild, mile wide. I knew a little bit about a lot of things. I didn't know a lot about anything, um, but I had to become an instant expert that day. That was my job. Um, but but the, the audience is, say, say in a crime story, the audience for a media interview are, are the victims, are the victims' families, are the people in the neighborhood where that occurred. It's our partner law enforcement agencies. It's our city council who sets our budget. It's our it, it's our, um, our state lawmakers who set our budget. And what are they hearing from us? And often that's not the question that the reporter is going to ask. Um, the reporter is going to ask questions in, in good faith. And we, we want to answer those questions, but we want to get across what is our message. And to figure out what our messaging is in each particular case, that means we actually have to think about it. We have to think about it. We have to prepare for it. We have to rehearse it. Um, we have to develop strategies. Maybe we write down those messages on a notepad because we're going to stand in front of a, of a television camera and we're going to get nervous. That's a thing. You know, that happens. Um, it happens to the best of us who, who do it all the time. And so how are we going to remember what those messages are? But, but managing our messages, understanding that, um, that the interviewer, the one asking the question, they, they may not have the right questions, but we have to take responsibility for our messaging. It's our credibility that's on the line. And when Lynn, you get that, 
I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say great, great points there because I was just thinking back, I was watching the press conference today from Arlington, Texas, and the chief of police was there. And Chris Cook, I don't know if he's there or he's out, but uh, he was he was somewhere else in the background. Chris is a great PIO, and I was looking at the chief. The chief had a notepad, and he flipped a page and read something off the notepad. So whether Chris prepared or the chief prepared, he was able to refer to notes that he had. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nobody can remember everything, and, and it's very important to realize that uh, if you're properly prepared, you can answer those questions because you have the tools that are in front of you to answer the question that might come up. Yep, yep. Knowing Chris and the chief in Arlington, I bet they both prepared um, and I bet they over prepared. So um, but we, we have to take responsibility for our messaging. And, you know, when you teach that um, to law enforcement, it's the same thing as when if they want to be the next canine officer, if they're promoting and they're going before an oral board, they want to be a sergeant or lieutenant. Why should that oral board, why should they promote them? So leave, or if you're speaking to the Rotary Club or you're giving a tour to the local Boy Scouts, leave that group, letting them know what's important to us. Don't leave them guessing. But when it comes to a media interview and that reporter doesn't leave that interview absolutely solid on what is the message of the Idaho State Police on this issue? What do we want and need people to know? You know what? The reporter is going to go back and do their job, but they're taking responsibility for putting that story together. We have to take responsibility for making sure that our message is clear and that that reporter understands what it is. And, and most of the time, and I've worked with hundreds of reporters over the years, like you, know, like you have, you know, most of the time, that's really what the reporter wants. They, they're looking to us as, as the experts, so we need to take that responsibility, be the subject matter expert. Great points, great points. So this goes into the next question. So let's talk about the what ifs. And, and again, this is about being prepared, but why is it really important to be able to address those what ifs? You know, um, speculation is, um, and if, I, if, I'm, if I'm following where you're going with the answer, you know, speculation is not something that we want to do in law enforcement. Yep, that's right. For a going. time, yeah, I, I heard you interview Dion Wah in Boulder a while back, and I've known Dion for years. Um, she's now working for police and fire in Boulder. And for a time, I was Boise police and fire. You know, firefighters can get away with speculating. They know that if they don't stop a fire at this wall, it's going to go to a, a, a certain, uh, a, a get the rest of the building or the right. inside. But in law enforcement, we have to say what things are. Um, and But speculation that, you know what, it, we just might be dumb enough to answer it and to guess. Um, so it's often a question. Uh, but focus on, be prepared for those speculative questions. Stay focused on what we know today, what our message is today, um, uh, and that keeps that that also keeps us on that keeps us on message. I agree. Judy Pell's got a great phrase for it, but um, it's the uh, care statement. Um, uh, using the care statement, and then the um, oh god, I'm brain dead now. I can't think of the. She's got an acronym for it, um, but. It's really important for us to make sure that we stay on that message and get our message across, and which is getting me to my the big question about what you guys do at the Idaho State Police. You came up with and developed a value be, a value based messaging philosophy. So I have two questions for you: Why did you develop it, and how is it being implemented? You know, I think today this is first of all, it's absolutely not a reaction to what is happening today. It's not a reaction to social media. It's not a reaction to cable news. It, it, you know, it goes back 200 years to Sir Robert Vincent Peale. We have to have public support for, for doing our job. But right now, today, what we're actually seeing is people literally questioning the legitimacy of law enforcement as a profession, which is crazy to even say. So the value that we provide is essential to, to share with the, the communities that, that pay for those services. What values are they getting? And I, I think I've always, I think we've always had a value-based messaging platform or what it's kind of the way I've always worked, but I, I gave it that name really after working downtown um, and working in the business environment and seeing that everything today is a value proposition um, in, in, the, in the business world. And the same, same within the public safety service world in the public service world. So, and, and, and when you think about value, think about, let me put it this way, what, is some, what do you value? If I asked you, what do you value? What's important to you? You'll probably say, yeah, what would be your answer? 
for me, I, I value transparency. I want to know the truth. You value transparency. Good, good, bad, or ugly. I want to know the truth. There you go. Amen. And amen to that. But, but personally, what, 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 what values, uh, what do you value personally? Family, family, um, uh, hard work and, um, compassion. There you go. All good answers. Your family, you value your family. You care about what happens to them. I want people to feel that same way for the Idaho state police. When we value something, we care about what happens to it. We want to protect it. it. It could be your dog. It could be your truck. It could be, but when you, when you care about something, when you value something, you want to protect it. I want people to value the work that the people of the Idaho state police do the service that they provide the people that they are and to have trust in the decisions that they make. So we work out key messages to do that. And our key messages that kind of the way I've put it in our communications plan is these are messages that sort of wrap around, they're sort of like a shell around our main message of the day. Like today, this morning, we did an interview on, on the, the horrific fentanyl epidemic that's sweeping the country. Idaho is not, not immune. So we, we took our key messages though, and we wrapped our main messages using our key messages, which are the value of ISP service, the values that legitimize our agency. Every agency has a mission, a vision, and a value statement. Let's make those statements mean something. Let's show people that we pay attention. We're trying to live up to those. You know, uh, Lynn, real quick, a question I always ask when I do training for social media and that with, with other law enforcement officers. First question I always ask is, what is your vision or mission statement? And usually it's like the deer in the headlights, the jaw drop, they don't even know what their agency or uh, their mission statement is. They can't even recite it. So how can they impart it to the public? So that I think is a really important thing for the PIO to make sure that they have a firm grasp on is the vision and mission statement of the agency. Bingo. And, you know, sometimes in a social media post, uh, I don't do it all the time, but, you know, I've actually written a social media post that says, this is our mission this is how we met that mission today. So literally telling people what our, what our mission is. But I want people to value the, 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 the service of Idaho State Police. I want them to, to know the values that legitimize our agency and, and to understand the values that we share with our community. The, the people are the police and the, and the police are the people. So what does that look like in your messaging? Things like we're in this together. Um, uh, we're fortunate to live and serve in, in Idaho. Public safety is the foundation for a strong and healthy messaging. And most importantly, what you just touched on, the message that we care, that the Idaho State Police is sincere in sharing empathy with the people in the communities that we serve and acknowledging that the emotions need to be met, perhaps even before the facts are given. And if we can reassure people sometimes, there, I, I love that saying, and forgive me, it's, it's not coming to me who, who's credited with saying it, but people don't, care, don't remember what you say, they remember how you made them feel. Yes. Like in that interview today that you watched from Arlington, Texas, if that chief, in whatever his words were, his tone of voice, the, 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 the expression on his face, the, the, literally the posture, the way he looked, where he was standing, if we can give people the impression that that we are trustworthy, that, that they can be reassured that we're here, that they have an ally in the Arlington police, in the Idaho State Police, that, that we are allies for them, that goes a long way. And then, of course, we have our, our media messages and what that means, but, and, but what we, we package it first in that, um, you know what, we, we get where you're coming from. People just want to know that we care about them. That's why we do our job. Maya Angelou said that statement. Was it my Angelo? Of course yes, it was. Yes. Yeah, she's she's fabulous. She's fabulous, of course. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yes, I'll, I'll yes. try not to forget that again. But That's we okay. literally take that. Yeah. We li we literally take that that why do we care and why should people care about the work that we do? I, I ask that all the time in what I'm writing, um, in a press release, whether it's an impaired driving emphasis or um, you know, one of our troopers was reading to a to a, a class of third graders. So how do we message that? in a way that people care about what we're doing. So you see a lot of public, a lot of social media posts that says, um, you know, it's a trooper reading to the, the classroom of students. Hey, we were happy to be at Mrs. Jones third grade class today. Hey, thanks for the invite. You kiddos are awesome. But what if we added a 
why are we there? Why is it important for that trooper to be reading to that class? So what if that social media post read something like, our kids need to know that when they feel unsafe, a trooper is their friend. That's why Trooper Jones was reading her favorite book to the kiddos in Mrs. Johnson's third grade class at Highlands Elementary. What if we just slide those little, why does this matter? We, we did a post yesterday on, um, it was the coolest post I'd done in a long time. It's the little things. You have to take joy in the little things. One of our troopers rescued an owl who had its talons wrapped up in plastic on the interstate, not a state, a very busy part of the interstate through Boise. Um, so she very carefully um, rescued the owl, waited for this animal uh, in distress guide. That, that's kind of, for us, it's blown up on social media as I knew it would. So oh, of course. Yeah, isn't that, and it was, and she got awesome photo and she had just been in my class. I had just done like a class for our troopers talking about a bunch of stuff. And, um, but at the, so we told the story of the owl rescue, but at the end of the story, we added the phrase, not everyone who needs assistance on our roadway is driving a car. Idaho State Police are happy to get everyone who needs it help getting home. Something like that. It, I, I just kind of butchered it. I think I wrote it better yesterday, but but you get where I'm going with it. Yep, I see now. Absolutely. I, just that little kind of value statement. It's who we are and what we do and why people should value our services because we're out there helping people. And guess what? Sometimes we're helping it, an owl. And what a great, what a great way to sum it up and then to, and then to return it back and, and talk about what you can do. You can do more. And, you know, and I think telling people about, you know, just bringing it back to, again to the value of our service, we're, we're very good and we've been very focused on the tools that we have. But if, if, People who are pub, uh, PIOs or communications officers, if you're hired because you know social media or you're hired because you know communications, learn your profession. Understand why the people are doing the job that they do, and then you will tell their story differently. It's, it, it, it's absolute. We need to get people to value the work that our people are literally dying for out there doing. And, and people have to value. And I think most people do. Yeah, I think they do too. I agree. I I absolutely think that 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 most of Americans do. Thank goodness. Um, But but we can't rely on that. We can't count on it. We can't take it for granted. Um, And we have to let them let people know that we value we value their support as well. Um, So we express gratitude frequently. That is also one of our our key messages. Is to to thank. We we started off. I think the post on the owl by thanking the people that called it in. Uh, hey, thanks to the motorist driving down a busy freeway, you called our dispatcher. Our dispatcher could get that little owl the help that they needed. So um, those those value-based messages, again, they, they come from the business world where everything is a value proposition. And we are just applying them literally to our product, which is public safety service. Excellent. Excellent job, Lynn. Great job. You hinted on this earlier. You talked about the opioid epidemic and, and specifically about the the fentanyl that is just pouring into the country and, and everybody in the, in the country, every law enforcement agency in the country is affected by this. How has your agency been working to address it and what efforts have you been taking in your messaging? Well, you know, interestingly, I just um, got the email from IACP that this month's uh, police chief magazine is on policing with empathy. And man, if there is, and I thought I saw that, and I'm like, dang, I should have. I wish I would have written an article for that. I would have loved to have talked about messaging with empathy. Um, we we all need to remind, be reminded about that. Sometimes our messaging is too justice based. Anyway, um, with with fentanyl, and man, you know what, Robert? I wish there were magic words to to stop the demand side of that drug. Um, but what we're doing is um, we're we're giving essentially the the problem when we when we are asked about this by reporters, and right now it's it's on everybody's mind. As we speak, our governor is down touring the border right now. That's a political statement, but the fact of the reality is that's where this stuff's coming from. So the, but our messaging is what are we doing about it? Um, but we can attack the supply side, and, and law enforcement's gonna gonna bust their butt attacking the supply side as best we can. We're looking for the manufacturers and the, and the people that are bringing this stuff in. But to attack the demand side, we need the community's help. We need to make this a community discussion where getting people who are struggling with addiction or in mental or emotional crisis and who are susceptible and vulnerable to experimenting or self-medicating with these drugs, that they get the help and they, and hope that they, they get the help that they need because it's just too dangerous right now to be experimenting with these drugs. I agree. Um, these are the 
Yeah, these are the most addictive, dangerous drugs that anybody's seen in their career. So we are, and, and honestly, what, I've, what I'm seeing in reporters when we talk about that, that we're pushing for people to, if you know someone who's suffering from addiction or in mental or, or emotional crisis, get them help right now before something really bad happens. The reporters are, are actually surprised to hear that. That's almost, it's not a brand new message, but it's not one that they hear very often from law enforcement. They're, they're used to hearing our kind of our hard, hardcore enforcement message. So when we have compassion for literally a street level drug user, and we're trying to not push them in jail, but but push them to treatment. And every all, all the law enforcement out there is nodding their head, going, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." But to actually talk about that publicly and right. to, to articulate it that way, um, that's almost a new message for us. Um, and it, and quite honestly, it, give me a better one. Give me a better one. It, it, it's something that we're struggling with right now. Um, we're trying to pull our community into being um, into ra- being a, raising awareness of this problem. And the best way that we can do it is to let them know that we can't arrest our way out of this. Um, we need the, the public to have some compassion for these people too, and to get them the services and the help and the hope. Right. And there's not, there's not one family that's probably in this country that has not had somebody affected uh, by the impact of opioids or fentanyl in one way, shape or form or some kind of addiction. So, you know, yep. getting them to understand that, you know, that it's going to take more than just law enforcement to address it is definitely key. And the, the, also the underlying message there is our, our community has to value the law enforcement effort and be part of and be a partner with law enforcement to do what the community can do. Law enforcement's going to do its part on the supply side. We need the community help to, to dampen the, the demand side. Um, over, uh, over Memorial Day, Idaho State uh, had 11 people killed on our highways. For Idaho, that's, that's a lot of people killed in traffic crashes. That, what do we what do we do with that? So uh, we, we talked about what kind of messaging can we push out there? And we pushed out that traffic safety has to become a, a community priority. Community groups, church groups, family groups need to discuss safe driving behaviors um, and partner with us. Help us help you uh, educate each other. So and I'll be darned if, if one of our local newspapers didn't pick that up as an editorial. Um, which I, I typically don't see them using our, our press releases and turning them into uh, editorials. They, they, they totally agreed with us. We, we need to start a community discussion on highway safety. What other words do we have when we just lost 11 people in car crashes right. that one weekend? So we need the community support. And the underlying mm-hmm. message is if the community supports us, they value us. So it, it, works, it works well together, but it's also incredibly sincere and really the only answer. Great way to sum it up, Glenn. Great way. So let's uh, lighten this up a little bit. Let's go into some rapid fire questions. Your drink of choice. Uh, I liked what Jeremy Warnick said. It depends on time of day. And I know you're a bourbon guy. And I said, well, I'm kind of a beer girl, but um, honestly, I'm black coffee, black coffee. Most of the day, that, that is my go-to. Favorite off work activity to do? Hiking. My husband and I are travelers and we love to explore on foot and we live in a great state to do that. Absolutely. Favorite food? Blueberry bread pudding a la mode. Wow. Very specific. Yes. That's very <laughs> that's very specific. There's like one restaurant in town that I know has that, but um, man, if you had that, you would like be making trips to Boise because you're like, yeah, that is it. Sweet tooth, totally guilty. What inspires you? Uh, professionally, certainly the people that I work with. Uh, you know, ISP is a, uh, is a full... Uh, police service agency. Only half the agency is commissioned. We have patrol. We have a full investigative team, um, but we have uh, uh, we have three crime labs, forensic science labs around the state. We have a, a lot of professional support for criminal justice uh, programs that support criminal justice programs around the state. And you know, when those folks, um, you know what they they just bust their tail. They're they're trying to do the right thing for the right reason every day. Uh, and I see them do that, and I think you know what my at the end of the day, they're trying to make a difference in their communities in the way that they can. Uh, and, and my job is to do my, is to do right by them, to try to tell their story um, in a way that, again, people understand the value of the work that they do. Because th- those people uh, in the Idaho State Police, they deserve that. In every single, in every single agency that is your audience right now, uh, the people working hard, they deserve for their, for their audience to understand what they do and to value what they do. So that's, that inspires me to do my job every day. Great. And do you have a book you would recommend to the audience and why? 
Well, my favorite book is always the book I'm reading at the moment, um, which would be uh, a book called Cloud Cuckoo Land, which is the new book by author Anthony Doerr. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with him. He's a Boise-based artist, a Perlitzer Prize-winning uh, novelist. This is his new novel. Um, but he, Anthony Doerr, writes and makes it art. And we literally, I will stop and marvel over a sentence that he has put together with the words that he uses. It, his, his Perlitzer Prize winning novel was All the Light We Cannot See. And it's a World War II novel. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. But I know we just write press releases and web copy and social media posts. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that we, we still need to look at what, what story are we telling? What words are we using that can tell that story? What, what art can we bring to our craft every day? And, um, and as silly as that may sound, I, uh, I still am somewhat idealistic in that I think that there is an art to our craft. And, and I am inspired by, by reading books from, from ter- terrific writers like Anthony Doerr. You have to read. You have to constantly expand your horizon. So I'll take a look at that when I get a chance. I, I'm got, you know what? You should. I'm down, yeah, about, like I'm down right now four books. I just got another one, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm behind right now on the ones I got to read. But I'll, I'll put that one on the list. I totally get you. I got a stack on my bed stand, but, um, but you know, it's also an escape. You know what we, I love what your audience says about your guests talk about networking and self-care. Uh, a book is a great way to just go someplace else for a little while. Absolutely. Lynn, anything else you'd like to add? Um, you know, honestly, Robert, I just want to thank you very much for what you're doing. I, I, I listen and, um, I, I benefited from the guests that you've had on some of them I know, but, um, you know, I, I have. I started off by by talking about a, a thirty year career. I feel incredibly blessed and fortunate, and you know, I, I have learned a lot from some of the people that you've had on your on your podcast. Well, that's Those good. people know who they are. They know who they are. Uh, but it is a it is a tremendous community of people, and man, there's there's a lot that goes into our jobs. But really, at the end of the day, we can make a difference. We can make a difference. And, and Absolutely. So, um, and that's one of the reasons yeah, why I, I came up yeah. with the podcast was for us to be able to share experiences and, and yeah, interact. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thanks for doing that. And, you know, I, I think my colleagues aren't down the hall. They're across the country. And thank you for bringing us together. And I, um, if they're within the sound of my voice right now, I just want to say thanks to those folks. You have um, you have helped me and you have helped the people of Idaho with the wisdom that you've given me. So so thanks for adding to that. You're welcome. And uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, uh go back and touch on. I talked about Judy Powell's statement that she has is it's a cap statement. So that's using care and concern, action and a perspective when you're, when you're making your original statement to keep you back on track. And then the PEP statement, which is about people, pets, environment, or property. So, you know, when you're, when you're trying to maintain control of a, of a, 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 a narrative so that you don't lose control of it. Um, so I just wanted to touch back on that. So Lynn, how can people best reach out to you if they want to learn more about your possibly connect? Uh, thanks for asking. You know, I would say um, probably LinkedIn. Uh, I know you like to ask people about their personal Twitter accounts. I have six active Twitter accounts on my phone and none of them are mine. They are all our, all our district accounts, but you know, probably LinkedIn, you know, and then I, I magically get an email that somebody messaged me. So, uh, so that's really cool. I, I wish I spent more time on LinkedIn. I don't have much time to spend on there, but I think it is a valuable networking service. So I will add it into the show notes. Excellent. Thanks, Robert. That was Lynn Hightower, Director of Communications for the Idaho State Police. Thank you for coming on the show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to contact the show, please email us at the PIO podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notified of the latest episode. If you are listening on a platform that allows reviews, please give us a review. We appreciate any review, good or bad. It helps us improve on each episode. Until next time, be safe.